Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Look, we are all here to, uh, to hear Jeff Rubin speak, so I am going to speak even more quickly than I usually do to get all of this out. <laughs> Jeff was the chief economist at CIBC World Markets for almost 20 years, and during that time, 10 consecutive years, he was voted the top Bay Street economist by the Brendan Woods Institutional Investor Ranking. He left in 2009 CIBC to read Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller. I certainly hope you have read that book. It is a fantastic read, as is The End of Growth. The book, his first book, won the National Business Book Award in Canada. I would put cash money that this book is also going to do the same. Jeff has been published and in, in French, Spanish, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Chinese. His writing and commentary have been featured on CNBC, CNN, CBC Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Rubin. Thank you very much. In the early 1970s, after the first OPEC oil shock, President Nixon implemented the Emergency Conservation Act, where they changed the speed highway limits to 55 miles an hour. But when you change the price of oil, you don't only change the speed at which you could drive your car, you also change the speed at which our economies can grow. If we know anything about the performance of the global economy over the last 40 years, we know this. Feed it cheap oil and it runs like a charm, but shock it with expensive oil and it seizes up almost immediately. Every major global recession has had oil's fingerprints on it, the last one being no different. But what is different about the last recession and previous oil shocks is that nobody has shut off the spigot. It's not that oil is not flowing, it's rather the price at which it flows. Anytime you start seeing oil prices in the triple digit range, as has been the case over the last year, you hear an expression called peak oil. And for most people, peak oil is about how much oil is under the ground. That's not the way that I see it. I don't think that peak oil is about what you can drill. I think peak oil is about what you can afford to burn. And there is a big difference between the two concepts. The world will never run out of oil in an absolute geological sense. There's 170 billion barrels of it in the Alberta tar sands alone, more in the Venezuelan oil sands. But what the world has run out of is the oil that we can afford to burn. And we see that today because no sooner had the global economy recovered from what was the deepest post-war recession that once again we see a rendezvous with the very prices that have killed growth. The problem that challenges all of our oil resources today, whether it's shale oil, tar sand oil, deep sea oil, is the prices that are needed to bring oil out of these resources are the same prices that cause our economy to roll over and die. Not knowing that we've changed the speed limit of our economy only makes things worse. Neither zero interest rates nor record budget deficits are a substitute for cheap fuel. They're not going to make us be able to run our economies any smoother. In fact, they're going to make it even harder to adjust. History says that both of these stances are unsustainable. Yet all around the world, we have adopted extreme measures 
so that we can be able to tread water in these kinds of circumstances. But what we're finding is that zero interest rates doesn't allow our economies to grow. They just lead to speculative bubbles like the subprime mortgage. Only last week, JP Morgan wrote off $2 billion. That's what happens in an environment of free credit. And when we look at fiscal deficits, we find that yesterday's bailouts are tomorrow's cutbacks. And we just have to look at what's happening in countries like Greece and Spain to understand that. What we've got to come to recognize is that our economies can no longer grow at the pace that they once did. And that's as true of the Canadian economy as it is of the Chinese and Indian economy. Just as Canada can no longer grow at 3%, like our central bank and our government thinks it could, China can no longer grow at the 8 to 10% when it has to run its economy on this kind of fuel. And that's a challenge that we've yet to come to understand because whether it's a condominium developer, whether it's the manager of an electronics store, or whether it's a finance minister looking to close a big budget gap, they all pray at the altar of growth. Economic growth is the holy grail. And it doesn't matter whether you're a left-wing economist who believes that we should stimulate until the cows come home, or a right-wing economist who believes that the market is always right and government has no role, the one common denominator that unifies all economic thinking is the unserving belief in pursuing growth. But what happens when we no longer can grow at the same pace that we've been accustomed to in the past? Is it the unmitigated disaster that we've been taught to believe? Curiously, when we look around the world and we see which societies and which economies have the most content and happiest people, they are seldom the economies that have the largest GDP. They are seldom even the economies that have the fastest growing GDP. Countries like Denmark consistently outpace countries like the United States. So maybe there's a message for all of us. When we're challenged with the need to cut back energy, we can just look at an economy like Japan. A year ago, almost 30% of all the power in the Japanese economy came from nuclear power. Today, Japan is virtually nuclear free as it's shut down 52 of its 54 nuclear power plants. And what Japan has done has been able to realize to consume less energy. I think as we find the challenges of a finite world pressing upon us, the adjustment is not to find some magic silver bullet, some magic fuel that will allow us to continue to live the way we have in the past. We can still shape the world we want but only if we're willing to let the world that we have known go. And I think what we will find is that as we feel the boundaries of a finite world pressing in upon us, the key to adjusting will be to learn to make do with less than always wanting for more. Thank you very much. So Jeff, what I want to start with is just stepping back a little bit in time before we move um, into the future. In 2000, you saw something that very, very few people did. I remember that, that era very well. Oil was around $20 a barrel. And you predicted at that time it was going to be significantly more expensive. What did, you, what did you get that the rest of the economists didn't get at that time? Well, just the notion of depletion, that we were running out of the cheap stuff that we all wanted to burn. And as I said in my opening comments, it's 
It's never that we're going to run out of oil in an absolute geological sense. But what we've increasingly doing is replacing easily accessible and cheap oil with resources that are more costly. I mean, take the notion of the Canadian tar sands, for example. It's, according to the International Energy Agency, the third largest oil reserve in the world. The notion of oil in the tar sands is not new. I mean, there was a pilot plant there as early as 1920. What's new is the notion that it could ever be a commercially viable source of supply. At 20 to $30 a barrel, you can't give the stuff away. You can't give the stuff away in Fort McMurray, nor can you give the stuff away in Venezuela. At $100 a barrel, Venezuela's oil reserves in their tar sands are now larger than Saudi Arabia, and Fort McMurray is the third largest reserve in the world. So I guess what I saw differently than other economists say in the year 2000 were they were looking at OPEC's price target, which at that time was 15 to 20 dollars a barrel, and said that's the price of oil. Whereas I was saying to myself, tomorrow's supply isn't coming from OPEC, and it's sure not going to be flowing at 20 dollars a barrel. Okay, so let's talk about now. So right now, we can round up. Oil's around $100 a barrel. If you had to give a price target for May 14th, 2014, two years, what would your price target be? Well, I don't know about in two years, but I'll tell you in two months, the next big move in oil is down. And that's not because oil is, cheap, is now cheap and abundant. That's only because the world economy couldn't afford to not be in a recession. In 2008, oil prices fell all the way from $147 a barrel to $40 a barrel. And that's because in the first time in 20 years, the world actually reduced its oil consumption. And that can happen again. But what you will notice is, and what I said at the end of my last book, triple digit oil prices in 2007-08 wasn't some speculative financial accident. It was where the demand and supply curves met. And the minute the economy recovered, even though oil prices plunged all the way down to $40 a barrel in the depths of the last recession, the minute the economy recovered, all of a sudden the world economy started burning oil. And the next thing you know, all of a sudden, we're looking at the same triple digit oil prices that proved so fatal only four, uh, three, four years ago. So essentially what we're going to be looking at then, if we can't predict what the price is, could be a, a continuing boom-bust cycle. Well, if, if we're not growing, we don't have a problem. <laughs> we can have $50, $60 oil if the global economy is not growing. The only problem is if we try to grow the economy before you know it, we're looking at these very prices. So that's what, what I'm talking about is not just another recession. Because even the deepest recession lasts three to four quarters. What I'm talking about is gearing down to a much slower rate of economic growth. And while I know that, you know, that has some pretty threatening and ominous overtones, I think I point out in my book that there are more than a few silver linings, at least in places like Canada, North America, and Western Europe, that we'll find in that world of slower growth. There are some parts of the world that can't afford to have slow growth. I would say that India, given what we know about, um, I think fewer than half the people have electricity. And China, not quite as dire, but those countries have to continue to grow. Should we really be thinking then about a bipolar world where there's Canada, US, and Europe have certain specific policies and China and India have different ones? Is this something you would advocate? I think what we can think of is a zero-sum world. Zero-sum is an expression that economists use to describe a situation where one party's gain is exactly offset by another party's loss. Well, you know, in a world where oil supply is not growing or growing at a very, very slow rate, it means that if one country increases its oil consumption from, say, 2 million barrels a day to 10 million barrels a day, as China has in the last 25 years, 
somewhere, somewhere else, somebody's got to reduce their oil consumption. Guess where that somewhere else is? That somewhere else is right here. But if oil drives growth, then not only is oil zero sum, but growth is zero sum. And in a world of increasingly finite resources, if economies like India and China are going to continue to grow at even half the rates that they've been growing in the past, somewhere else, other economies have to stop growing. And again, I think those adjustments are in, are in economies like Canada. Canada can deal with much slower growth than economies in the developing world. Canada's birth rate is below replacement rate. And that's basically true of every OECD country. And what happens when economic growth slows in advanced industrial countries is invariably immigration slows. But in countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Uganda, you know, those populations aren't growing because of immigration. Those populations are growing because of birth rates still in, in the four to five range. And, and that's where I think triple digit oil prices has a much, a much more dramatic, a much more Malthusian challenge than it would pose in places like Canada and the United States. Now, how would you reconcile sort of your theory with natural gas prices that are lower than they've been really f for as long as many people can remember? Wouldn't they tend to move in lockstep? Well, the very fact that natural gas prices are at a decade low and oil prices are, world oil prices, Brent's $110, tells you right off the bat that you're talking about apples and oranges. Because believe me, if they were perfectly substitutes, they would be arbitraged in one nanosecond given the huge price disparity. Now, in many cases, we have substituted natural gas for oil. When I was a kid growing up in Toronto, my parents' furnace ran on oil, as did most of the furnaces in North America. And after the first OPEC oil shock, we replaced oil-fired oil furnaces with natural gas-fired furnaces. We used to burn oil, and they still do in the Middle East, to generate electricity. We don't do that in North America anymore. We burn natural gas. And we can substitute natural gas for oil when it comes to making plastics and other, uh, other, hydro, other, um, you know, other hydrocarbons. But the one area that we cannot substitute natural gas for oil is as a transit fuel. Because no matter how we move goods or people around our economy, whether we move it by air, whether we move it by boat, whether we move it by rail, or whether we move it by truck, we are burning one fuel and one fuel only, and that's oil. It may take different forms, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, but it's oil, not natural gas. And there's a reason for that, because oil has about four times the energy density. So if you do see, for example, a natural gas vehicle, and there are many propane taxis, if you're taking a propane taxi to the airport, I hope you're not carrying a whole bunch of luggage because you'll find that the, ga the propane gas tank in the trunk of that taxi takes up half the trunk. And that's not an accident. That's, that's a reflection of the fact that it's one quarter of the energy density of oil. But isn't in that, though, in that story, isn't that a possible solution in a way around this kind, of, this kind of scenario of low growth? And that is that markets will figure it out and the inexorable laws of supply and demand will say, I'm perfectly happy to go to that, to, go to, that, to take that taxi and I'll put some of my luggage in the back seat. Well, I think more likely it's going to be, I'm perfectly happy to ride my bike or I'm perfectly happy to take urban transit. Because given where oil prices are going, driving is going to become more like it was at the time of Henry Ford and the Model T. In those days, only the wealthy drove. But if only the wealthy are driving, then why don't we have more toll roads? Why are we using public taxpayers' money for roads that few of us are going to use? 
I would argue that we should have last time, instead of bailing out the auto companies, made a massive investment in public transit. You know, the mayor of our city, when he first became inaugurated, said the war on the car is over. I believe the war on the car has just begun. And the enemy is not Metro councillors. The enemy is $2 a liter gasoline. And I think that when we have to pay those prices, we'll become European in a big hurry. Because after all, Europeans have been paying those prices for the last decade simply because of taxes.